Hello and welcome to another Cafe Imports education video. Today we're going to talk about the seed and the machine and their relationship during the roasting process. As we know from other episodes, the coffee roasting machine is a rotating convection oven, a heat delivery system, and the coffee seed itself is a complex organism loaded with potential flavor. Our job as roasters is to control the way the coffee seed takes on heat from the machine and thus cooks by accurately operating that roasting machine. So I've heard roasters say that all coffees with a certain density should have a very specific profile. Other roasters focus on the moisture of the green coffee alone. Still others say that density and moisture are too much to look at and a roaster should only look at things like variety and processing. If I'm being honest, I've gone through periods of saying all of the above. I'll describe some of these things and then you will hopefully be able to choose what green coffee attributes you want to measure and you want to keep track of in your own roasting program. Screen size, for instance, or the diameter across the seed's narrow width is an important thing to dig into. The size of something that you wish to cook is obviously a determining factor in how quickly that thing will cook. It's also important to look at not only the screen size of a coffee seed as it varies individually seed to seed, but also as it distributes the sizes of seeds within a batch. Let's look at individual seeds first. If there are two seeds, one's big, one is small, and they're both exposed to the same number of BTUs in the same exact way for the same amount of time, all things being equal other than their size alone, the smaller seed will be more cooked or more roasted than the larger seed. This is just like cooking any other product. If one steak is bigger than the other and you cook the two steaks side by side, they'll be cooked to different levels. Another factor to consider is that there will be times when there are coffees of different sizes in the same batch. It's easy to imagine that the larger seeds will be under roasted and the smaller seeds over roasted. This is not necessarily the case since the coffee is absorbing heat not only as individual units but also as a whole mass. The smaller beans that are absorbing heat more quickly will also more readily displace that heat energy onto the larger seeds that are absorbing heat more slowly. Thermal diffusion or the movement of heat from areas of high heat energy or hot areas to areas of low heat energy or cooler regions is still at work bean to bean, as well as machine to bean. There are, of course, even more complications to this. A roaster can get a wider range of bean sizes to roast to a more consistent level by roasting the coffee low and slow. The wider the range of bean sizes in the batch, the longer the roast will likely need to drag on in order to get consistency. For large, more conventional style machines, Having very similar bean sizes is critical to roasting consistently. Some large commercial machines can roast thousands of pounds of coffee in less than five minutes. Some even as fast as under two minutes. At these speeds and at that level of energy transfer, a small coffee seed that may sneak into a batch may as well be a matchstick. It's a liability to the company. Specialty coffee roasters, on the other hand, can have relatively high success rates when working with coffees of varying sizes even in the same batch, because their machines are smaller. A smaller machine, and by smaller, I'm still including drum roasters of fairly large size, simply not conventional coffee roasting machines. At any rate, a small, more artisan approach generally requires a longer roast on a machine that, allow, that allows for adjustments to be made in live time to control that even roasting. Now, by longer, I don't mean like 30 minutes, I mean longer than two or three minutes. The way a coffee was processed after picking not only has a huge impact on how the coffee will eventually taste, but it actually affects how the coffee will respond in the roasting process. In general terms, when we think about roasting coffee and rules surrounding the process of roasting, we're focused on the species Café Arabica that has been processed through fermentation and washing. We call these washed coffees. The way we roast Wash coffee seems fairly straightforward because these are the vast majority of what most roasters handle and thus all of our thinking kind of centers on this major style of coffee. 
However, when a roaster gets their hands on their first naturally processed coffee, or maybe a coffee that was wet hulled or honeyed, many of the rules begin to break down. There are, of course, many theories as to why different processes require different roasting approaches and which approach is right or wrong. I'm not going to get into the prescription of how to go about roasting one process differently than another. Instead, I simply want to shed light on the fact that a roaster needs to consider process, carefully record how they roast, record the outcomes, and build systems and trends for differently processed coffees, just as they would for a washed coffee. Let's move on to freshness. A very fresh coffee will roast very differently than when the same coffee is older. Remember, coffee is alive and changing. There are chemical changes and structural changes that can take place in the green coffee as it ages. Again, keeping good records of roast can illuminate both change in the green coffee and the trajectory of correlation in roast adjustments that are made over time. This helps to keep the coffee roasting consistent. This data and the trajectory that it points to can save a roaster a lot of time and inform them of what the next changes on the future batches need to be. Density. Density also correlates to how many compounds a coffee has. If there are two seeds of the exact same size, but one weighs more than the other, the heavier seed is more dense and is filled with more stuff, hopefully good stuff. This means that there's a lot more flavor potential in a dense seed. I think of flavor potential as bandwidth to play with. A very dense coffee is more likely to taste good at many different profiles. This means that as a roaster, a more dense coffee can give me a wider field in which to better express myself to the interpretation of how I want to shape the coffee drinker's experience. A less dense coffee, on the other hand, has much less to offer, being lower quality, usually not always, but that means that the roaster has their job cut out for them. It's much harder to get a great roast of a poor quality coffee than an extraordinary roast of a high quality coffee. This is one of the major reasons roasters love quality coffee. Now, let's talk about moisture. Moisture content is the percentage of whole green seed that is actually free water. In general terms, we at Cafe Imports like to see about 9 to 11% moisture. The SCA currently recommends about 8 to 12% moisture. Some roasters theorize that moisture can act as a wick to bring heat from the outer cell layers of the coffee to the core, especially early on in the roast. Other roasters theorize that as the moisture is leaving the coffee, it can act almost as a barrier to heating, as the evaporative process can cause cooling in, this, in some environmental conditions. There are potentially valid points in both thoughts, and they are likely not mutually exclusive. So what I'm going to tell you is Definitely, by tracking moisture in collaboration with these other attributes, you'll begin to see trends develop. Though some coffees with high moisture readings may not follow those trends, they may roast similar to other coffees with low moisture readings, it's important to track those trends. The quantity of coffee put into a drum, which we refer to as batch size, will drastically affect how the coffee takes on heat. An overcharged drum will clog airflow and usually causes uneven roasting. The areas of the bean mass that are closer to the heat source can absorb heat at a rate that is higher than the areas of the bean mass that are further away from that source. When the batch is portioned correctly, coffee that is in an area of the drum with a higher heat concentration can then move freely and displace that heat to areas of cooler beans, and the cooler beans can then move to areas of higher heat within the drum. An overcharged drum will slow that movement of coffee, and thus the diffusion of heat through the coffee evenly. Likewise, an undercharged drum could also lead to uneven roasting. If there are not enough coffee seeds in the drum for the drum to use as a catalyst for movement, the coffee may not rotate through the drum in a way that evenly distributes that heat. Further complicating this, the bean temperature probe may not be affected by as many beans touching it and so may not give you an accurate reading as to how the coffee is taking on heat. While I point out that these pieces of data are important to record and track, think about them kind of like a puzzle. Each of these pieces of data on its own is somewhat unimportant and may lead to a roaster making poor decisions. However, when collectively applied over time, these pieces of data can empower a roaster to more informed decisions.
Okay, let's get back to the relationship between a seed and a machine. While the coffee is roasting, it's not merely taking on heat, it's also changing. By cooking the coffee, we're converting the stored food in the seed into available flavor for extraction through the breakdown and reassembly of molecules. This process does a lot more than just creating flavor. During the roasting process, a coffee seed can expand in size to upwards of two or even three times its own original volume. This means that the coffee is becoming less and less dense. Remember, density is a mass over volume, and if the volume increases but the mass does not, density goes down. Along with this, the coffee is also losing some of the original mass. Firstly, the coffee leaches off a lot of the free moisture it was holding on to at first in the form of steam. This accounts for the majority of the coffee's weight loss during roasting. Next, as the heat energizes molecules and they begin to break down, snippets of those molecules become gas and leave the seed along with the steam that is being generated. We see and smell these tiny volatile particles as aromatic smoke or steam rising from the roasted coffee. Those of you who use the trier on the machine to smell along as the coffee roasts, well, you can certainly attest to the existence of these volatile compounds. When the explosion of these begins to push out of the coffee, in an event we call first crack, the aroma can be magical. Although the aroma is delightful, the event itself is not significant as it pertains to flavor, in my opinion. It's not an action or a causal event, but rather it's a reaction and an effect event that occurs due to all of the molecular change that has been building up or happening previously to it. As molecules break apart, they fill the space with the particles they are being pushed away. This manifests in the cell matrix as expansion. Internal expansion does not go without its effect on the structure of the coffee. It inflates the coffee until the coffee has no choice but to almost burst. The moment this occurs is when the coffee makes up the sound of a pop and a small blast of aromatics is smelled and you can actually hear the percussion of that energy released. Although this is a period in which a lot of the volatile materials are pushed out of the seed, more have already left and more are certain to leave as the roasting process continues. There are a lot of tools that can help you measure the effect that roasting had on the physical state of coffee. We recommend getting some version of a color spectrometer, which measures the color of the finished product. This, of course, will show the depth of roast that a coffee has reached. We recommend taking a reading of the whole bean and then taking a reading of the coffee at a fine grind. Recording the whole bean reading and the ground, or what we call the internal reading, and the variance between the two will add further resolution to the trends and profiles you're trying to maintain. Using your roasting machine to change the coffee from raw to roasted can seem fairly simple, and at its core, it truly is. Keeping good records, using appropriate tools that provide you clear, measurable data, and understanding what events are caused and what events are effects is paramount to understanding the relationships between the machine and the seed, and to building a good roasting program. We hope that this video has shed light on some helpful information that can hopefully push your roasting program to the next level.